Next, let's consider the uh, of equal potentials. What is an equal potential or equal potential line? Well, by definition, this is a line on which every point has the same exact value of electrostatic potential. And we have learned, of course, before electro, electric field lines, right? Let's say you have an electric field line like that. Now, if you move along the electric field line, okay, if you move along the electric field line, what happens to the electric potential? What happens to the electric potential? Well, the potential will decrease, okay, because a positive charge will then be pushed from here to there, uh, meaning that it's going to lose potential energy and gain kinetic energy by the electric field, and therefore the potential will go down. Okay, so it's losing potential energy in to gain kinetic energy, and therefore the potential is lower as you move along the field line. But if you go against it, the field line, uh, you know, uh, then the electrostatic force does negative work. In return, you will get higher electro potential energy, so the potential goes up. So as you move along the electric field line, the potential will either go down this way or go up that way. So if you want to stay the same potential value, you cannot possibly move along the electric field line, and therefore, what's the choice? Yeah, you have to move a, a perpendicular to the field line, right? Instead of instead of you know parallel to it. So suppose I start from here, okay? I have to cross the electric field line perpendicularly if I want to draw an equal potential or equal potential line. So this is one possibility. Okay, I'm going to draw one possibility like this. So this line is the equal potential line. And let me draw another line here in the same spirit. Make sure they cross each other at 90 degrees. Okay, so 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and so on. And then I'm going to draw another line. Okay, similar idea. So once I have a set of equal potential line or equal potentials, then I can draw the electric field line and vice versa. All right. Now, suppose I have an electric potential line uh, distribution like this, equal potential distribution like this. This is say 10 volts, okay? And then I, next I have nine volts equal potential and then eight volts equal potential and then seven volts equal potential and six volts equal potential and so on. Okay, what can you say about the corresponding field distribution? Well, again, on every one of these equal potentials, the potential is the same. If you use a gravitational analogy, you know the gravitational potential energy is proportional to the height, right? So if you think of this as a gravitational potential line, then every line would have the same height, and therefore what you're getting is a map of equal heights, right? Map of equal heights. So it's like, you know, take a bird's eye view of, the, of a mountain range, and this will be the summit. Right? And this is a little bit lower, say 100 meters lower, this is 200 meters lower, 300 meters lower, and, 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 and so on. Now, suppose you want to, you want to uh, climb that mountain, okay? You want to climb that mountain. Do you think it's easier to go this way or that way? Either way, you're going to reach the summit, right? Reach the summit. You, you climb the same distance, the same vertical height. But between here and there, it's quite steep, okay? Because every time you move a little bit horizontally, you're going to go up a lot vertically yet here you move a lot horizontally you only go up by the same amount vertically compared with there and therefore this is less steep easier to climb this is steeper so in terms of gravitational force you have more gravitational force you encounter more gravitational resistance if you go this way and less if you go that way uh, if you go back to the case of, the, of electrostatic field okay um, if you draw an equal potential distribution like that then, of course, you can always draw the corresponding uh, electric field. And what you'll find is that over here, the electric fields are weaker. And over there, the electric fields are stronger. Why? Because over there, you see, you cover a very small distance. The potential drops by the same amount. Here, you cover a much greater distance. The potential drops just by the same amount. So therefore, the, the field will be weaker on this side and stronger on that side. And one can easily draw the potential uh, the the, the field lines if I if I want to so you just make sure you stay you know you stay perpendicular okay, perpendicular perpendicular all the time so here's another line okay, here's another line and uh, here is uh, another line another line and so on and over here you can always draw it you know just be patient like this 
eh, like this. Make sure it's always perpendicular. So that will be uh, how you draw the electric field lines according to the equal potentials. So when you move along the equal potential, does your electrostatic potential energy change? No, it doesn't because it's always equal to Q times V and V is a constant. It's very much like, um, you know, you move on the same floor, horizontal floor, your, put, your gravitational potential energy does not change. It's because gravity does zero work on you as you move on the same floor. But you go up and down, that's when gravity does work and your gravitational potential energy would change. All right, now, suppose I have an ideal conductor here. And, you know, you can have a certain amount of charge distribution on the surface. In an ideal conductor, E is equal to zero, as we discussed in a previous chapter. So as you move anywhere inside the ideal conductor, does the potential change? No, it doesn't, because the electrostatic force does zero work, because the force is zero, right? It, it, if it does zero work, there is no potential change. So the entire body of a, an ideal conductor is an equal potential body, and its surface is an equal potential surface. So this is one equal potential line, okay? And right outside of it, I can draw another equal potential line if I want. Here's another equal potential line. And then right and then next to it, I can draw yet another one, and so on. Okay? And the field lines are just perpendicular. You know, the field lines will be just perpendicular. Like this. And so on. Okay? I can draw some more on, on that side if I want to. So, this is the concept of equal potentials. As an interesting application, let's consider the following setup. I have a large, larger ideal conductor, you know, spherical conductor of radius R1 charged with Q1, and then I have a smaller one charged with Q2 and radius is R2. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect them with a very long wire, conducting wire. Okay, this is why it's so long that this big sphere and the smaller sphere are very, very far apart. So that the field here and the field there, they pretty much do not interfere with each other because those charges are so far removed from the charges over there that those charges will not really affect the charge distribution there. And therefore, essentially, we have a uniform charge distribution here and also a uniform charge distribution there. But the fact that you connect them with the same, with a conducting wire tells you that the entire body, including the big one and the small one, and the wire, are now connected with conducting materials so that electrons can flow freely be in between them so that everything, this guy, this guy, this guy, must have the same what? The same exact potential, okay? Because if the potential were to be higher here and lower there, then electrons will flow from the lower potential region to the higher potential region until they establish the same potential. And that is the only time when the flow of electrons will stop. Okay, so this is what the conducting wire does. It equalizes the electric potential without disrupting the, uni the, 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 the spherical nature of the electric field here and there. Now, given that, let me ask you, how does one calculate the electric potential produced by the larger sphere? Okay, in other words, taking infinity as the zero point of electric potential. What is the electric potential here, anywhere on the bigger sphere? Well, imagine again, you draw a line all the way from infinity, all the way up until you reach the surface. Forget about that one, that's very, very far away, okay? Once you're outside, anytime you're outside, this thing looks like what? Just a point charge, right? Q1 at the center. Therefore, uh, all the way un up until here, uh, the, you know, the potential just go like KQ over R. And in particular, when you are when you land it on the surface, the radius is just R1. Therefore, the potential here is just V1 on the surface, Q1, K over R1. Right. Similarly, you can consider the potential on the smaller sphere. When you do so, forget about the big sphere, okay? Because it's very very far away. So for the smaller sphere, I have on the surface V2 equals to K Q2 over R2. Right? But wait a minute. These two spheres are connected by a connecting wire. So V1 and V2 must be what? Must be equal. Otherwise, there will be a flow of electrons from one sphere to the other. Right? So we conclude that V1 must be equal to V2. And therefore, 
this expression equals that expression. In other words, Q1 over R1 equals Q2 over R2. Okay, now, what does that tell us about the surface charge distribution, sigma 1 and sigma 2? You know sigma 1, by definition, is Q1 over what? Over A1, right? What's A1? The surface area of the larger sphere, which is just 4 pi R1 squared. So, that is Q1 over 4 pi R1 squared. Okay, I can write this as Q1 equals to 4 pi R1 squared sigma 1. And similarly, I have Q2 equals 4 pi R2 squared sigma 2. Now, if I plug these two expressions into here, okay, into here, what am I going to get? I get Q1, which is this, divided by R1, okay? So that, that is 4 pi R1 squared sigma 1 over R1. That equals Q2 over R2. This is Q2, okay? 4 pi R2 squared sigma 2 over R2. So cancel one power of R1 and one power of R2, and you get and cancel 4 pi as well. You get R1 sigma 1 equals R2 sigma 2. In other words, sigma 1 over sigma 2 equals what? R2 over R1. So the uh, charge surface charge density sigma is inversely proportional to the radius. Okay? Sigma 1 and over sigma 2 is R2 over R1, not R1 over R2. So the smaller sphere has a stronger has a greater surface charge density than the larger one. Okay? In other words, if charges want to find a place to stay on the surface of a conductor, it likes to congregate, it likes to concentrate on the smaller one with sharper edge. All right? It does not like flatter surfaces because that's where sigma is smaller. So, this is just an extreme case when you have conducting very long skinny wire conducting between them. But you know, the general idea is can, can be applied to different objects. Suppose I have an object like this, okay, a rod like this. It's a one piece of conductor, okay. And uh, I charge it up so that it's got some charges on it. The question is, you know the charges on the surface, right, on the outer, outer surface. But the question is, where, which part of the outer surface is it more likely to find these charges? Okay, so there's a flat portion. There is a curved portion, and there is a greater curved portion. So, as you know, the flatter portion in our discussion here, sigma will be less. Okay, so here is a curved portion. You get more charges here. But this tip is where it's curved the most. Therefore, you got a whole bunch of charges. Okay, just a whole bunch of charges here. And we also learned from the previous chapter that the surface, uh, right outside the surface of an ideal conductor, E is proportional to sigma, right? In fact, it's equal to sigma over epsilon naught, if you recall. So the question now is, where outside this conducting rod would you have, would you find the greatest value of electric field? Is it in the flat portion, on the, on the bigger curved part, on the smaller curved part, or on the tip? Well, obviously, now you can see it's on the tip because on this tip, you have the strongest concentration of charges. Sigma is the greatest, so E is also the greatest. Okay, so here is an in important observation. When you have a piece of metal, a piece of conductor, when you charge it up, the uh, charges will go to the surface, to the outer surface, but which part of the outer surface are you more likely to find charges? Well, it's the, it's the surface with sharp, it's the part of the surface with sharp edges. Okay, so if you have a needle, right? If a metal needle, you charge it up. Most of the charge will be found at the needle tip, around the needle tip. This is also where the electric field right outside is the strongest. So, you, you know, due to the concentration of charge, you have a very strong electric field right outside. Okay, so in, uh, to put it simply, charges like sharp corners. Okay, they want to find a sharp corner and stay over there. They are attracted by sharp corners. Can you think of an application of this phenomenon once you know that charges like sharp corners? All right. Suppose there is a thunderstorm. You know, during a thunderstorm, here's the graph, okay. 
there is a great potential difference between a charged piece of cloud and the ground. And because of that, uh, some charges will want to escape like this. And which path do they take? Well, remember, charges like sharp corners. Okay? Suppose this is a meadowland, you know, you know, in the middle of nowhere. It's all flat, and you're walking here. Right? You're walking here. Remember, you, the human body, is actually a conductor. It's not a very good one, but it's a conductor. And so these charges want to find a victim, right? Find something that it want, where it wants to go. And where do they want to go? They want to go to a sharp corner. And guess where that is? That's you, right? Because you know you're not flat. You are the one that's, that 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 stands up. So guess what? You might be struck. Okay. Now, of course, that would be an extreme example. But suppose you're in a city. Okay, you're in a city uh, with uh, with with you know tall buildings, that sort of thing. Okay. So here's a tall building, and here's another one, and here's yet another one. Okay. Which one is more likely to be struck? Well, probably the one that's tallest. All right. Especially if it's got sharp corners. Now, lightning damage is a big problem for buildings. So, how does one solve this problem? Well, again, charges like sharp corners. If you want the charges from the cloud to bypass this building, what you can do is you set something up which is even more attractive to these charges than the building itself. Right? So, what do you do? Can you think of a device that does that? Well, yeah, it is called the lightning rod. It was invented by who? By Ben Franklin. Okay, basically, it's just a metal rod with sharp edges, and it conducts all the way to the ground. Okay, now this metal rod is even more attractive than the building itself to the cloud, to the charged cloud. So the, the charges will get dumped here and channel it they got channeled all the way down to the ground where they safely disperse then you can they can bypass the building leaving the building undamaged this is how a lightning rod works okay a lightning rod they use the fact it utilizes the fact that charges like to seek out sharp corners in the metal piece this is where they want to go and then this is how the lightning rod is built and then that's how they bypass the building.